Good morning, everybody, and welcome to what I think is the 44th National Rail Heritage Awards ceremony. It's a pleasure to see so many of you here today, and also we welcome everybody who's watching the live feed, which seems to get more popular year by year. It started as something for COVID, um, but it's become a very good way of getting a lot of extra people seeing this, the event. I'm delighted today that we're joined by Ptolemy Dean, the much respected architect, surveyor of the fabric of Westminster Abbey, a broadcaster, and most importantly, my colleague as a director of the Railway Heritage Trust. Um, I don't think there's much more for me to say at this stage, so let's get on with the important stuff, and can I welcome Tim Headley-Jones to give the presentation. Thank you, Andy. I'd like to echo Andy's welcome to this year's awards. In its various guises, the competition has now been running for 45 years, an impressive achievement. Since 1989, we have, we have seen hundreds of superb restoration projects and have been privileged to make awards to many of them. It is now possible, courtesy of John Laverty and Preservica.com, to look at some of this history. You can just go to the National Railway Heritage Awards website and be inspired both by the past and for the future. As always, we need to express our great thanks to all the sponsors. Quite literally, without their support, these awards would not be possible. We're immensely grateful to them all for continuing their backing through these unprecedented times. So now let's turn to the awards themselves. And we begin with the Bam Nuttall Partnership Award. This is given for the greatest heritage improvement works made to any historic railway structure as part of a jointly funded project. And there are three shortlisted candidates for the award this year. The first of which is for the Heritage and Community Space Project at Bruce Grove in North London, entered by Arriva Rail London. The station at Bruce Grove opened in 1872 by the Great Eastern Railway in order to serve an area that had developed as a result of the expansion of London in the late 19th century. Situated on the Lee Valley line between Seven Sisters and Tottenham, the appearance of the station was modified in the 1980s. The changes included the loss of the down platform canopy and the up building being boarded up and abandoned while Haringey Council funded a shorter replacement of the lost canopy to the original design, lack of maintenance has seen the upside buildings continue to deteriorate badly. In February 2023, work commenced on a two-year programme. The work on the main station building was extensive. This included the gutting of the building back to bare brick to allow full stabilisation of the elevated structure and the complete replacement of the roof structure. The external brickwork was cleaned and repointed. The doors and windows were fitted with the chimney pots, um, the doors and windows were fitted whilst the chimney pots were reinstated. In addition, the great eastern pattern daggerboard fascias have been reinstated to both canopies. Internally, the space has been subdivided. The newly created waiting and meeting rooms have been fitted out to recreate the original Victorian style with wainscoting, ceiling cornices, fireplaces, handmade wooden benches, sash windows and panelled doors. More modern accommodation has been provided for the staff and storage areas. The scheme is a great achievement by Riva Rail London and is an act of faith in providing this heritage environment for passengers in an area that is not always kind to its surroundings. The second shortlisted entry was made by Bromley Council and the Friends of Crystal Palace Subway. It covers the work undertaken on the Grade 2 star listed subway that once served Crystal Palace High Level Station. The subway 
located beneath Crystal Palace Parade, was designed as a pathway to provide access for first-class passengers to the relocated Crystal Palace from the London, Chatham and Dover Railway's Crystal Palace High Level Station, which opened in 1865. Designed by Charles Barry Jr., the station, which was never as successful as its promoters had hoped, was finally closed in 1956 and demolished five years later. However, the subway survived, albeit gradually deteriorating in condition. But interest in the structure grew, and between, 1879, between 1979 and 1994, it was opened on occasions for special events. After a further period of decline, it was displayed to the public in 2013, and the campaign for its restoration grew. Ownership of the park, including the subway, passed to the Crystal Palace Park Trust in 2023, with work on the subway's restoration having commenced the previous year. The hall had lost its roof, leading to deterioration of the brickwork and features. A replica was considered impractical and a maintenance liability, so a pitched and glazed roof of functional but sympathetic design has been installed over the renovated Portland stone floor with its starburst decoration. This both protects the structure and provides a vital event space. The four walls of the square hall have been cleaned and repointed with lime mortar, as have the passages linking it to the sets of steps to the side, second class steps. The steps themselves have been restored or replaced where necessary and modern, unobtrusive step level lights installed. The Crystal Palace Park has never been sustainable and this, this project is part of efforts to make it so by repurposing a quite remarkable railway structure so little known that it isn't even mentioned in Gordon Biddle's British Historic Railway Buildings, despite its grade two star listing. All involved are to be congratulated on what has been achieved. The final entry was entered by South Eastern and covers work undertaken at Margate Station in Kent. Whilst the railway first reached Margate in the 1840s, the Southern Railway undertook the rationalization of the local lines in the mid-1920s, and the current Margate Station was one of the consequences of this work. Designed by Maxwell Fry, the building is now listed Grade 2. Southeastern trains decided to improve the station's functionality, passenger facilities, and disabled access. In addition, conscious of the station's architectural and historical significance, it also undertook the cleaning, repair, and repainting of the exterior of the building. The buffet, long closed, has had had a suspended ceiling installed that blocked off the ceiling and the tops of the windows. This has been reopened and splendidly restored with the ceiling replaced with a new one set at the full height and the decorative wall mouldings restored with lime plaster. The lighting units are derived from a 1920s design. In the booking hall, the parquet flooring has been repaired, cleaned and varnished, decorative features repaired or replaced, and the painting done to a high standard using the original colours derived from analysis of old paintwork. The pendant light fittings, now with energy efficient lamps, have been reused as they look appropriate. Similarly, the 1970s ticket office front has been retained. This is an attractive project that restores and reveals the historic fabric of this impressive and architecturally important station building. The scheme is a credit to South Eastern and one that must be greatly appreciated by its passengers. So which of this unusual trio is the winner of the BAM Nuttall Partnership Award 2024? And I'm pleased to announce that the award of the BAM Nuttall Partnership Award for 2024 goes to Bromley Council and the Friends of Crystal Palace Subway for the work completed on the subway at Crystal Palace. And I'd now like to invite Sue Giovanni and Lydia Lee to receive the award with, from Chris Lawler of BAM Nuttall.
So we now move on to the London Underground Craft Skills Award, which recognises the best use of traditional craft skills in restoring a heritage building or structure. And there are three shortlisted projects for this award. The first of this trio was entered by the Landmark Trust for the work completed on the station at Alton in Staffordshire. Situated close to the country home of the Earl of Shrewsbury, the station was renamed Alton Towers in 1954. Alton Station was situated on the North Staffordshire Railway route through the Churnet Valley, which opened in 1849. At Alton, the line passed close to Alton Towers and Alton Castle, both belonging to the Earl of Shrewsbury. The Earl required a station. His preferred style was Gothic Revival, with Pugin as his favourite architect. But therein lies an enigma. The station provided was nothing of the sort, looking more, much more like an Italian villa. It is therefore thought that Henry Arthur Hunt, a London architect who did much work for the railway, undertook the design. The line was closed in 1965, and four years later, Staffordshire County Council purchased sections of the track bed for conversion into a footpath and cycleway. It sought a new use for the redundant station. The landmark trust was approached and the heavily vandalized station was transferred in 1972. Initially, the station building was simply repaired with a station master's house converted for use as a holiday let. A full restoration of the main building was undertaken in 2008. With the old waiting room in use as lounge and dining accommodation for the holiday let, the condition of the tiled floor began to cause concern. Cracking of tiles, damage to edges, and unevenness of surfaces were becoming apparent. Investigation revealed voids under the substrata, leading to risk of further damage. A specialist survey was undertaken, leading to a plan to carry out repairs to the substrata and replace damaged tiles, but retaining as much of the original tiling as possible. It was found necessary to manufacture new tiles to replace 112 of the roundels, equivalent to about six square meters. In total, this involved the manufacture of 2,240 new tiles. These were made to traditional dust-pressed tile techniques by Wink Hill Mill in Stoke-on-Trent, which is located on the same site as the original Milton Hollins works. This is a wonderful project which has enabled the restoration and retention of a superbly early tiled floor, which should now give good service for many years to come. The whole project shows that a great deal of effort and trouble has gone into identifying problems and finding ways of using materials to the original specifications and undertaking the work using traditional methods and skills. The second shortlisted entry was also, was also made by TransLink for the refurbishment of the sand drying chimney at Bangor in County Down. The brick sand drying chimney and attached stone outbuildings were erected as part of the original railway line by the Belfast, Hollywood and Bangor Railway, which opened in May 1865. The sand drying plant was used to dry sand which was later applied to the head of the rail in order to prevent steam locomotive wheels slipping on wet or greasy rails. Problem we're still sadly familiar with today. Dieselization in the early 1950s rendered the adjacent locomotive shed re redundant. After some years of disuse, much of the building was demolished, but the sand drying chimney survived. After 70 years of neglect, there was concern about the condition of the chimney, which stands beside the operational railway, and TransLink obtained the necessary permissions to demolish it. However, research by a community campaign showed it to be the last surviving sand drying chimney in Ireland, and possibly in the UK. TransLink responded by developing a scheme to conserve this rare, if not unique, structure. Initial work required the removal of much vegetation, graffiti, and spoil around the base of the building. 
the upper five courses of brickwork on the chimney had to be rebuilt using the original bricks. Elsewhere, a small number of spalled bricks were replaced with reclaimed bricks of good matched source quality. The surviving walls of the adjacent stone building, where the sand was stored and dried, form the remainder of this entry. Some small portions of the walls had to be rebuilt, parts of the arches forming a window and doorway required resetting, and coping stones on the top of the walls were also reset. Overall, this con conservation project has been completed to a very high standard, and it is just a pity that it is not possible to have better public access to it. TransLink deserve great credit for taking the decision to restore the structure rather than taking the cheaper option of simply demolishing it. The third shortlisted candidate was entered by Nexus and covers the refurbishment of the stained glass at Monk St Seaton Station. Monk Seaton Station is a busy station on the Tyne and Weir Metro. Built by the North Eastern Railway in 1915, it is larger than most stations on the line, having been built originally as a junction for the unopened line to Colliwell. The main station building on Platform 2 had extensive facilities and an overall roof with glazed panels at each end. In 1983, the appearance was further enhanced by the installation of large stained glass panels within the glass, section, glass screens. Designed by the ar artist Mike Davis, the north end features a seaside beach scene, while that at the southern end depicts shipyards, reflecting the once predominant industry on the River Tyne in a larger full-height floor-to-roof panel. This scheme entailed the dismantling of both stained glass panels, their refurbishment, replacement of the steelwork and glass screens, and reinstallation of the strengthened structure. Each panel was carefully cleaned, polished, and re-leaded by a team from the National Glass Centre, led by Claire Watkinson, a former student of the original artist. The project has completely transformed and refreshed these two major items of public art. Remounted in modern reinforced steel frames, they form an impressive backdrop to this busy station. The work demonstrates a commendable commitment to public art and to improving the built environment for the traveling public. All in all, three varied projects, but which of the trio has won the London Underground Craft Skills Award 2024? And the winner is the Landmark Trust for the careful work undertaken in the restoration of the floor tiles at Alton Station. So please step forward, Stuart Levy and Joanne Quimby from the Landmark Trust to receive the London Underground Craft Skills Award plaque from Gareth Leslie of Transport for London. So we now move on to the Arch Company Urban Heritage Award. This award recognises the success of a train operator, station owner or other partnership in ensuring consistently high quality upkeep and enhancement of the environment of a significant urban station within its care so as to perpetuate the historic ambience as consistent with modern passenger requirements. And there are three shortlisted entries in this category. The first of these was entered by Network Rail for work undertaken on the Grade B listed 
Lanark Station. Although the railway to Lanark opened courtesy of the Lanark Railways in 1855, the current station was completed more than a decade later after the line was taken over by the Caledonian Railway and extended through to Muirkirk. The line to Muirkirk closed in 1964, leaving Lanark at the end of a branch. Since 2019, work has been undertaken on the restoration of the station in four phases. The first phase encompassed repairs to the railings and the stairway entrance. This work included the replacement of missing sections of the railings to the original design. Phases two and three saw work completed on the main station buildings. The project has tried to maintain and refurbish original features in a sympathetic manner. The replacement lead work on the main roof, as well as the new timber barge boards, have been finished to a high standard. The original Balahulish state slates were repaired and specified by the original and, and reused on the street elevation, thereby maintaining the original look to the building. On the platform elevation, where original slates had been lost, Welsh slates were used as they were a close match. Random stonework repairs have been carried out to a high standard and new stone was matched to the original. The final phase, completed in 2024, was to the building on Platform 2. Work on this included new glazing bars and glass. Welsh slates were used as they again matched the original. New lead work complements the new glazing and slates. Extensive timber rot repairs were carried out on the building structure with the fitting of new timber windows of the appropriate design. The new paintwork gives a fresh appearance to the completed works. With all phases now complete, the station has been brought back to its former glory. The work is to a good standard throughout and all materials have been selected to meet the heritage of the station. Great care has been taken on the restoration and due diligence by the design team has created an excellent restoration which will ensure the building is fit for purpose for many years to come. The second shortlisted entry in this category came from Network Rail for the restoration of Block E at Paddington Station. The building that comprises the entry was completed in 1881 as one of the main buildings of the station offices and included the Great Western Railway's London boardroom. The external appearance was modified during the 1920s through the insertion of windows to the top cornice. The building was substantially damaged and lost its north end due to a parachute mine in 1941. Since then, it has been adapted at various times to include accommodation for the booking hall, offices, storage, a pub, and the continued existence on the, of the boardroom on the first floor. The outside of the building received perfunctory post-war repairs using unsuitable materials, and the whole exterior was painted over to give a uniform appearance. In March 2023, work commenced on an 18-month project to restore the structure to its original condition. The work threw up various challenges and opportunities which have been impressively handled. The contractor was skeptical about the value of trying to expose the stonework at ground level, which was presumably specified by the original architect. The beautiful banding of the sandstone which has been revealed is a delightful vindication of the effort. To future-proof the prominent cornice, weight was taken out of each section by excavating the concrete, filling with terracotta granules to give the mass without the weight, capping with cement board, sealing and dressing with lead work of outstanding quality. It was expected that 40% of the attractive molding around the windows would require repairs. In reality, it turned out to be 65 to 70%. This really is an impressive entry, both for the quality of the work done and the likely favorable impact on the wider station. 
it largely puts rights the wrongs of the damage caused by the 1941 bombing and the subsequent abuse of the maintenance regime applied to it. It sets a great example to follow for Network Rail and others with the professional care of such heritage buildings. It was also a challenging site to work on, with innovative solutions for scaffolding and cleaning adopted. The final entry for this award has been made by Network Rail Scotland for the reconstruction of the building on Platform 1 at Troon. The station at Troon was designed by James Miller for the Glasgow and South Western Railway and opened in 1892. The buildings were listed as Grade B in 1984. But on 17th of July 2021, the Platform 1 building was damaged beyond repair by a major fire that also left the overhead line equipment unusable. Emergency repairs enabled the line to be reopened to electric traction after six days. Fortunately, the contemporary building on platform two, the station footbridge and the small contemporary storage building on platform one were undamaged. Following consultations, it was decided to undertake the construction of a rep replica of the original station based on the surviving elements, the eight steel beams from the destroyed building. The replacement building has been designed to follow the same curved footprint as the original. The roof covering is Welsh slate surmounted by clay ridge tiles to the same pattern as the original. The cast iron rainwater goods also reproduce the originals. The seven bay glazed canopy was damaged beyond repair and the glazed roofs with finials have been replicated reusing the original brackets. The quality of the material and workmanship on all the wooden features is excellent. The pragmatic approach taken by Historic Environment Scotland and South Ayrshire Council to the proposed design of the interior of the new building has unlocked opportunities to address current and future customer and operational requirements. This has resulted in the provision of a modern booking office, improved staff facilities, a larger waiting room, additional toilets, and a changing places facility for people with multiple disabilities, plus a space for commercial use or special events, all being fully accessible. This faithful reconstruction of the Platform 1 building and canopy at Troon Station is a delight to behold and displays a fine use of materials, an outstanding quality of workmanship and a smart decor throughout. Troon Station has now been restored to the glorious style and quality that James Miller bequeathed when he designed this prestigious work back in 1892. So three excellent and very varied examples, which, but which of them has been most successful in the eyes of the adjudicators? And I'm pleased to announce that the Arch Company Urban Heritage Award for 2024 goes to Network Rail Scotland for the superb reconstruction of the historic station at Troon. And I'd now like to invise, invite Louise McSmith and James Montgomery from Network Rail and David McGahn from Amco Giffen up to receive their award from Craig McWilliam from the Arch Company. Next we come to the Structures Restoration Award 
sponsored by TransLink. This award is given for the successful restoration, modification, or adaptation for new use of any historic railway or tramway civil engineering structure in any ownership. There are three shortlisted entries for this award. The first of the shortlisted entries was made by Network Rail, Wales and Western for the restoration of the Grade 2 star listed Barmouth Viaduct on the Cambrian coastline. The 900 yard long bridge was built for the Aberystwyth and Welsh Coast Railway and completed in 1867. The majority of the structure was completed in timber but the northernmost spans were constructed in metal to provide a navigation channel via a lifting section. Over the years, the bridge has undergone a number of alterations. These included the replacement of the original lifting section by a swing bridge and regular work in maintaining the wooden sections. Inspection of the viaduct indicated that the metal sections were life expired and required replacement rather than piecemeal repair. Following consultation, it was decided to rebuild the bridge, but retain as far as possible its original appearance, both in profile and detail. Given the location in the estuary, it was decided to build the new spans on the far bank and effectively wheel them across the timber viaduct to put them in place. Attention to detail has been far-reaching. The old structures were riveted and network rail has used round-headed bolts to give the appearance of rivets. In areas where there are no bolts, dummy rivet heads have been provided. In addition, every effort was made to retain as much of the original ancillary fabric of the structure as possible, including retention of all of the deck level lever and mechanisms associated with the operation of the long disused swing bridge. These elements were sent away for a full refurbishment and were then refitted in identical locations on the new structure. Likewise, as much of the original swing mechanism was retained as was practical, with only the upper slew ring being removed to provide a suitable foundation for the new structure. Although the listed building consent process meant Network Rail was left with little choice but to provide new steel structures that closely resembled the previous ones, it has done this with a great deal of thought, imagination, and a lot of close attention to detail, and as a result, has produced a stunning structure. The second of the shortlisted entries was made by the National Railway Museum for the relocation and restoration of the historic Gornless Bridge to locomotion at Shildon. Regarded as the world's first railway bridge to be constructed in iron, the Gornless Bridge over the river at West Auckland was designed by George Stevenson for the Stockton and Darlington Railway and cast by Burrell and Company of Newcastle. The bridge was completed in 1823, with the line opening two years later. A fourth span was added in 1825 following flooding. The section of line over the bridge fell into disuse in 1856. However, the structure remained intact until 1901 when it was dismantled. It was later re-erected in the Queen Street Museum, York, for its opening in 1928 and moved to the National Railway Museum in 1975 where it stood near to the museum entrance for many years. As the museum developed, the bridge became less accessible to visitors and was latterly mostly out of sight and falling into dis disrepair. In 2020, it was announced that the National Railway Museum had committed to relocating the bridge to Shildon, with work on the project commencing in early 2023. In undertaking the work, the team faced a number of challenges, not least the dedicate, delicate nature of the structural components necessitating careful dismantling, transport and re-erection. The work identified damage that had occurred when the bridge had been relocated to York. It was found that most of the original nuts and bolts were either bent or rusted beyond reuse. The replacements 
were the only new metalwork required in the restoration. The final challenge was the paintwork for the bridge. Research was undertaken into historic documents related to the bridge. As the paintwork was stripped back to the base metal, green and white paint was found in one of the early layers. It was finally decided to adopt these colours, which have given the structure a very striking appearance in its more prominent new location. That such an historic item has now been given such prominence is most commendable. The total cost of the project seems modest, especially as it has enabled such an important item to be brought back into public view after being largely hidden for many years while at York that it is now attracting public interest and is only a few miles from its original location is admirable. The third shortlisted entry was made by Gloucestershire Warwickshire Steam Railway for the work undertaken on the stabilization of the parapets on Stanway Viaduct near Toddington. The 200 meter long viaduct was constructed by the Great Western Railway as part of the route linking Stratford-upon-Avon with Cheltenham and was completed despite a partial collapse during construction the previous year in 1904. The line finally closed in 1976 and the track was lifted three years later. With the track bed preserved, work commenced some 20 years ago on the Heritage Gloucestershire War Warwickshire Railway's northbound extension towards Broadway and the first trains over the reopened line operated in 2010. The viaduct has suffered water penetration over many decades with consequent damage to the brickwork. Some repairs had been undertaken in the past but had not addressed the root cause, namely failure of the waterproofing. It was therefore decided to carry out the necessary drainage improvement and waterproofing works. During this work, it became evident that there were major issues with the stability of the parapet walls, which were slowly leaning outwards. The key to success in addressing this unexpected problem was the collaborative manner in which the entrant, its consultant and contractor, quickly developed a plan for the work. The challenge was how to stabilize the parapets while retaining the external heritage appearance of the viaduct. Advantage was taken of the new concrete slab to cast in stainless steel anchor bars. Along each parapet, stainless steel bolts were bolted. Stainless steel plates were bolted. Each one was then connected to an anchor bar with a stainless steel wire rope, in turn anchored into the new concrete slab. The project is an exceptionally commendable way of demonstrating that contemporary solutions can go hand in hand with historic structural elements to create solutions which are not only practically successful and affordable, but in their own way can enhance the structure itself. It is a fine example of a considered approach with the application of innovative thought and the team deserve huge congratulations on what has been achieved. So, three very different schemes for our adjudicators to decide upon, but the winner of the TransLink Structures Award 2024 is Network Rail Wales and Western Route for the excellent work undertaken on Barmouth Viaduct. So would Helen Hodgson and Sonny Robinson from Network Rail please join us on the stage to receive the award from Barry McCusker of TransLink.
I don't know whether that's George Stevenson ringing up to find out why he didn't win, but uh, <laughs> let's, uh, let's move on. Congratulations to all the entries. They were all very worthy. Um, so we now move on to the Great Western Railway Operational Enhancement Award, which is given for a scheme that demonstrates the greatest improvement in user accessibility while still sustaining the location's heritage features. And there are three shortlisted entries for this category. The first of these covers the work undertaken at Brickett Wood in Hertfordshire that was entered by the Brickett Wood Station Heritage Trust. Although opened with the St Albans branch by the London and North Western Railway in 1858, the building that forms the entry dates to the first decade of the 20th century when the station was considerably enlarged and rebuilt. The station became unstaffed in the 1960s and over the years its condition deteriorated. A fire in the early 1970s resulted in a new roof and for a brief period in the early 1990s the building was used as offices. Unused for more than 20 years, it deteriorated with most doors and windows bricked up and the interior gutted. The roof failed at the front wall, which led to its partial collapse, along with two of the four station canopy supporting beams. As this compromised the stability and safety of the station canopy, Network Rail carried out repairs to the canopy beams and replaced the station building roof. The entrance acquired a 99-year lease on the building and in 2022 commenced a project to restore it. Externally, the building has been tastefully restored with bricks and brick slips to match the existing, with new doors and windows. Cast iron downpipes have been installed and corbel bricks were specially molded to match the existing. Station signage and benches have been replaced with authentic replicas from the pre-grouping period. Notice boards and a luminaire have been added to complete the period look. Internally, the building has a kitchen area, divisible by a roller shutter, a seating area, a store for the village archives, and an accessibility compliant toilet. All of these features have been carefully specified to give an authentic period look. Special mention should go to the lighting, toilet feet fittings and display boards around the cafe that complete the look. The work has been carried over, out over some years and is of a uniformly high standard. The, the new accessible community space is well used by local people as well as visitors. Altogether, this is an excellent scheme showing great attention to detail and an example of how a redundant building completely abandoned by everyone, can be brought back into beneficial use. The second shortlisted entry for the award was made by the Langothlan Railway Trust and covers the work to create a new terminus at Corwin. Corwin is the western terminus of the Langothlan Railway and the station opened in 2023, replacing a temporary station built further east to enable earlier reopening of the railway to the town. The entry is completely new build, although some salvaged components have been used. The site is to the east of the original site of Corwin Station on the Ruaban to Barmouth line that closed in 1965. The station consists of an island platform with a central section covered by a canopy. This is mounted on a central brick block in 1907 GWR vernacular and cast iron columns recovered from Blackfriars station which support the canopy. The canopy roof is a steel structure with uneven pitches to each side reflecting the track curvature finished with GWR style fascia board, dagger boards. The rainwater goods have been made from metal. Fencing at the Barmouth end of the platform is in GWR style spear tops. At the Rabban end is an umbrella-type water tower, fed from a borehole at the foot of the embankment. The mechanism for this is placed in a corrugated iron building of a typical GWR design. Although not yet in use, 
the GWR signal box from Western Rin has been re-erected at the Ruaban end of the station. It is hoped to initially control the crossover at that end of the station from it and eventually to use it to signal two train working in the station. The station itself is decorated in British Railways Western Region chocolate and cream and directional signage is a mixture of both Great Western and Western Region Gill Sands styles as was usually the case in the 1950s. Great Western lamps are provided along the platform. There are period advertisements around the station. This is an exemplar of the challenges that have to be met with new build trying to follow building styles of over 100 years ago. Overall, the volunteers have worked hard to secure the funding to progress this work and to make the statement a statement. In that, they have succeeded wonderfully. Congratulations to everyone who has worked on this challenging project. A very impressive achievement for a volunteer organisation. The final shortlisted entry for the award was entered by Story Contracting, MHB Consultants and Network Rail and covers the work undertaken on Camps Viaduct between Airbles and Hamilton Central stations. The 193 metre long viaduct with its 13 spans was originally completed in 1856 for the Les Mahago Railway passing to the Caledonian Railway shortly after construction. Initially built with a timber deck for a single track line, the viaduct was soon rebuilt with a wrought iron superstructure capable of taking double track. In January 2023, work commenced on a project to ensure that the viaduct remained capable of handling current and planned traffic over the line. The anticipated work was extensive and included repairs to the concrete deck installed in the mid-1950s and the installation of a new walkway. Work was finally completed in March 2024. The repair and strengthening of the main girders to restore the required route availability capacity and maintain current permissible line speeds formed the major element of the project. This required around 1,200 individual metalwork repairs resulting in the addition of 65 tonnes of new steel to the structure. This was a complex process as this could not involve welding as no satisfactory techniques exist to deal with the metallic properties of wrought iron. Modern fasteners were used to connect new steel plates where needed by existing rivet holes. The masonry abutments and piers were found to be in generally fair condition. However, after devegetation, localised repairs were carried out to areas of spalling and poor pointing. Underwater inspection indicated no significant scour at the masonry foundations. However, to help future-proof the structure, rock armour was installed on both east and west riverbanks to provide scour protection and significantly lower the flood risk rating. The practical engineering solutions implemented at this structure all demonstrate a pragmatic approach to issues and a consistently high standard of work. These should avoid rapid deterioration of any elements that could jeopardise the availability or capacity of this important route. The viaduct can now continue to meet all the current and anticipated operational needs well into the 21st century. Three very varied projects, but which has won? So the GWR Operational Enhancement Award 2024 is made to Brickett Woods Station Heritage Trust for the meticulous work undertaken in restoring the station at Brickett Wood. So would David Horton and Robert York from the Trust please come up to join Joe Graham from GWR to receive the award.
Not, not enough was made of the quality of the cakes in the cafe at Brickett Wood in, in what I just said. So uh, given that they're the winners, I think a shameless plug uh, for the cafe at Brickett Wood is, is, is due, and, uh, and I heartily recommend it to, to anyone to make a trip down the St. Albans line. Um, so we now move uh, to the Railway Heritage Trust Conservation Award which is for the best restored listed or historic structure to which the Trust has contributed funding. And we begin with the first of three very different entries shortlisted for this award. And the first shortlisted candidate was entered by Network Rail for the restoration of the canopies at Great Malvern. Now the railway reached Great Malvern in 1860 and E.W. Elmsley a Worcester architect, was appointed to design the station. Rather unusually, the work included the design of the approach road, which wrapped around an area of gardens laid out in front of the building, all of which is still in place. The station buildings suffered a serious fire in the 1980s, but fortunately, a comprehensive and sensitive restoration scheme was completed in 1988. This was increasingly showing its age, and in recent years, the canopy structures had deteriorated with missing glazing, leaking roofs, peeling paint, and some of the delicate floral decorations of the columns had disappeared. More were in danger of being lost. In 2023, a comprehensive scheme was undertaken on both canopies to bring them back to their former glory with a full repainting scheme to complete the work. The local organisations had prudently retrieved many of the missing column decorations and placed them in safe keeping. These were retrieved and either reused or used as patterns for replacements. All of the delicate column decorations were removed for repair and repainting by specialists and refixed. For the main upside canopy, a major issue was the glazing, which had deteriorated badly. It was replaced by a new twin-fix system. Guttering was found to have deteriorated. All was replaced by bespoke galvanised steel box gutters to the original dimensions. Both canopies received new weatherproof covering, and the dagger boards to the canopy faces were either refurbished or replaced with timber being retained throughout to preserve the heritage appearance and sections. Overall, this is a most commendable and very well executed scheme. The work has been carried out to an extremely high standard and the attention to detail has been extremely good. For passengers, it makes the platforms very pleasant places to wait for trains. All concerned can be justifiably proud of what they have achieved. The second entry covers the renovation of the station at Henley in Arden, which was entered by the Friends of Henley Railway Station Community Interest Company, and its conversion into a community space with bar. The Great Western Railway built Henley in Arden Railway Station in 1908 as part of its new main line between Birmingham Snow Hill and Cheltenham by Stratford-upon-Avon. The station building and canopies on the island platform were demolished in the early 1970s, leaving only the station building and the canopy on the southbound platform. And that, that is the subject of this project. By 1992, the station had become unstaffed and the building that remained had its buildings and doorways boarded over. With the passage of time, both building and canopy were deteriorating. For passengers using the station, and even those just passing through, the derelict station building presented a poor and unwelcoming image of the railway. Following the creation of a friends organization and its conversion into a community interest company, work commenced in December 2022 on a project to restore the building for community use. Work was completed in early 2024. Externally, work included recovering the oversailing roof section above the building, the removal of redundant brick chimneys, with the one retained being utilised for a wood-burning stove, and repairs were made to the brickwork. 
Internally, the building has received a new floor and ceilings, whilst windows have been installed in contemporary metal frames, but using the glazing style of the original GWR windows. Some doors, door furniture and slate panels recovered from the original toilets and items from the booking hall have been incorporated. The former cast iron and timber barrier from in front of the ticket office window has been incorporated in the bar area. This is a most impressive entry which re reflects the values of partnership, commercially considered work and the work of volunteers. The entrants deserve high praise and recognition for the work of all who are and were involved and dedicated to the success of this project. And the last candidate was the entry made by Colt Construction Limited for the restoration work undertaken to the shelter on Platform 2 at Market Raisin. The Grade 2 listed Market Raisin station was constructed in 1848 by the Great Grimsby and Sheffield Junction Railway and included several platform structures beneath an overall roof. This was removed in 1941, following which the waiting shelter provided the only undercover passenger accommodation on the down platform, but this also exposed the timber structure to the weather. Post beaching, most of the station infrastructure was removed. The station became unstaffed in the 1990s and became increasingly neglected and vandalised. In 2004, the Market Raisin Station Adoption Group took on the role of looking after the station. Basic repairs to the waiting room were carried out in 2006, but with the failure of the sole plates and other main structural timbers, a full restoration was required. This was completed by the entrant between August and October 2023. The work included replacement of the sole plate and much of the structural framework. Where possible, the original materials were reused. Replacement weatherboarding and dagger boards were manufactured using the originals as patterns. The opportunity was taken to install a moisture barrier and treat timbers against insect and mold infestation. Internally, the fireplace has been restored, information and artwork boards have been fitted, along with a clock and seating. The colour scheme is based on the LNER 1937 scheme, which suits the shelter very well. Windows were carefully dismantled and serviced with replacement glazing bars matching the 1960s profile fitted. Tropical hardwoods were used for sills to provide a long life. So although a relatively small scheme, the restoration of this waiting room has demonstrated great attention to detail and an excellent level of workmanship. All involved can be justifiably proud of what they have achieved. Altogether, three interesting examples of conservation projects. And I'm pleased to announce that the Railway Heritage Trust Conservation Award 2024 goes to Colt Construction Limited for the excellent work undertaken at Market Brazen. And I'd now like to invite Joe Telford and Paul Willis from the company up to the stage to receive the award from my colleague Anna Gipps of the Railway Heritage Trust. It's a good job I'm not involved in the judging process because I would have awarded first prize to all three of those. But uh, um, certainly the market raising one very, very well um, deserved. And the uh, volunteer group who work at market raising, um, like many around the country, do an absolutely fantastic job to keep their station well looked after, well used, and, and somewhere that is a, is a great, great way of welcoming people to the railway network. 
So congratulations to Colt for that work at Market Raisin. Um, we now come to the Volunteers Award, sponsored by Network Rail. And this award reflects the fact that many of the projects that we see, particularly on heritage railways, have relied on volunteers both to raise the funding and also to undertake the actual physical work. It is for this reason that this award is the only one today that comes with a financial contribution to support the winning entry. There are three shortlisted entries for this special recognition of volunteer contributions. And we start off with the restored rail motor hut at Gothland, which was entered by the North Yorkshire Moors Railway. Once common on railways in the United Kingdom, in particular on the former London and North Eastern Railway lines, the rail motor hut at Gothland is one of only two such huts remaining on the line. Motor huts were provided for the storage of plate layers trolleys, and these were operated by the track maintenance gangs and used to travel along the line and move materials. Since the 1960s, the hut has been used by the North Yorkshire Moors Railway as a store by lineside teams, and more recently, the lineside conservation team. Over the years, it had become dilapidated and filled with miscellaneous items. Fortunately, the turntable equipment for operating a rail motor survived intact. The hut had degraded severely, particularly to the corrugated iron cladding near ground level, and a new frame, front doors, and sections of tin panel were needed. Where serviceable, the original corrugated panels were stripped, treated, and painted. These were sufficient to cover the front and sides, but not the rear. New corrugated panels were obtained and fitted to the rear. Although having a slightly different profile, these have no adverse visual impact. The quality of the restoration of the motor hut is excellent. Care has been taken right down to the individual fastenings that have been refurbished or replaced with matching items. To provide long-term protection, the panels have been given an undercoat and three top coats of deep cream paint as applied by the LNER. Such relatively small schemes are important to complete the operational history of railways and could, can all too often be overlooked. The North Yorkshire Moors Railway has been con congratulated on this scheme. The second of the shortlisted entries in this category is the Weybridge office at Gothland and was also entered by the North Yorkshire Moors Railway. Although the Whitby and Pickering Railway was one of the oldest in the country, dating to the 1830s, the Grade II listed station at Gothland was built by the North Eastern Railway in 1865 to a design of Thomas Prosser. Amongst the facilities provided was offices that served the Weybridge provided for the goods yard. Dating to the station's rebuilding, the structure was modified in the 1880s. Following closure of the line in 1865 and its subsequent preservation, the office was used for a variety of purposes. Some external work was undertaken in 2013, but it was decided to refit the interior of the building to how it would have appeared in the 1920s when it was in use as the Weybridge office. Work was completed in 2023. The repair of the windows and door has been carried out to a high standard and now looks attractive in its late Northeastern Railway livery. Rainwater goods have been restored, as has the roof tiling in Welsh slate. Lime mortar and plaster have been used throughout, with mechanical services being discreet and sympathetic to the period being interpreted. Care has been taken to fit out the interior with items that would have been found in a way bridge in the early 20th century restored and installed by volunteers to a high standard. This is a small project, but one showing exemplary research, planning and delivery. The volunteers are to be commended for the quality of their restoration work, including the internal set dressing, which has created an authentic representation of a late Northeastern Railway Weybridge office. The third entry was made by the Festiniog Railway Society for restoration of the exterior of Penryn Station. The Grade II listed station opened in 1865 on a narrow shelf cut into the hillside and comprised little more than just a small hut. It was replaced in 1877 
allegedly using components from the original harbour station at Port Maddock. The station and line now form part of the World Heritage Site associated with the local slate industry. Although the interior of the building and the adjacent co-op shop now formed accommodation for volunteers, over the years, the exterior of the station, partially constructed in wood, had deteriorated. And in August 2022, volunteers from the railway started a two-year program for its restoration. With the slate roof in good condition, much of the work involved replacing timber work. This included cladding, barge boards, window frames, and the platform canopy. In addition, work saw the replacement of three brick chimney stacks on the southern elevation. With the work on the cladding, opportunity was taken to install insulation, which has already made a huge improvement to the internal environment of the building. Finally, there has been a complete repaint in the Festiniog Railway Heritage colour scheme for minor stations. Considerable attention was taken to conserve original doors and windows on the platform side, including a ticket sales hatch. The careful attention to addressing rainwater runoff at window sills and at the foot of new cladding should help reduce the need for repairs in future years. Overall, this is an excellent scheme executed to the Festiniog Railway's high standards and will conserve and prolong the building's use for decades to come. The volunteer team involved should be congratulated for achieving this outcome. Three very differing and impressive schemes, but which of this trio has caught the eye of the awards panel? So the winner of the Network Rail Volunteers Award 2024 goes to the Festiniog Railway Society for the renovation of the exterior at Penryn. So would Alan Norton and Simon Starr from the Society join us on stage to receive the award from Tom Higginson of Network Rail. So sticking with the, the contribution that people make to the success of our railway, um, we're now going to move on to the Avanti West Coast Community Award. And this award is designed to recognise the restoration, refurbishment or other improvement of a station or building, either by a community group or for a community use that connects communities and promotes social inclusion. And there are three shortlisted entries. The first of these was made by the Turning Tides Project Community Interest Company for the renovation of the station tea room at the Grade 2 listed Crediton station in Devon. The station was built by the Exeter and Crediton Railway Company and opened in 1851. The main building is no longer used for railway purposes. It is leased from the Arch Company and let to the entrance. They are a community interest company promoting equal access to music, arts and life with particular focus on learning disabilities or autism, focusing on the work they do and the difference made. The tea rooms at the station have existed for many years. Before the entrance took over in 2018, the space had been run by one woman for some 18 years. Since acquiring the tea rooms, Turning Tides has undertaken a significant amount of work in improving the facilities. Delayed by COVID, work on the site finally commenced in late 2023 and was completed in March 2024. The new toilets are to building regulation standards. A hoist is also available and the to toilets are fully accessible. 
The main structural work was the widening of the door from the cafe to the toilets. The existing door was not original and appears to have been a basic replacement. The new door is a six-panelled Georgian-style door, much more in keeping with its setting. The original booking office screen has long gone. The enlarged main room has a friendly, quirky ambience with amusing clutter, but with neatly decorated skirtings, wall, picture rail, frieze, and ceiling cornice. For an interior of these proportions, many would consider the retention of a picture rail and frieze margin most appropriate. Turning tides must be praised for this work, which whilst relatively small in terms of area, has significantly improved the offer to their customers. The improved internal arrangements will hopefully secure the future of this attractive listed building. The second entry was made by the Llanethly Railway Goods Shed Trust and encompasses the restoration of the Grade two listed offices at the former goods shed at Llanethly. The original offices were opened in 1875 to serve as administrative support for the activities in the goods shed. They were extended in the early 20th century along with the expansion of the main goods shed. But the shed and offices were closed in 1965. The offices were subsequently used by British Rail for operational and training purposes until the 1980s, after which time they too became disused and the current works began. Work commenced in March 2021 and was completed 18 months later. Externally, the work included the restoration of the roof and the sash windows, while the entrance porch was completely rebuilt to match the original structure. In addition, work was undertaken on the walls and on the floors. Internally, original features have been retained, repaired, or replaced on a like-for-like -like basis. Of necessity, new toilets and kitchens were installed on each floor with an interconnecting lift, but within those constraints, the configuration of the offices were designed as far as possible to reflect the original layout. This is an excellent project that has brought new life to an otherwise redundant structure. The, the entrants are to be congratulated on the work that they have achieved thus far and the quality of the workmanship demonstrated. Now, the third entry for this award was made by the Summit Education Society for the work undertaken on Stepney Station in Hull, designed by William Botterill for the York and North Midland Railway and opened in 1853, Stepney Station grew in importance with the opening of the North Eastern Railway's lines to Hornsey and Withensey a decade later. The station remained in passenger use until 1964, although freight services continued to Victoria docks until 1868. The station subsequently served as a private house and community centre. It's now owned by the entrance, and during 2023, work was undertaken on the building as part of the Beverley Road Townscape Heritage Scheme, funded by Hull City Council and National Lottery Heritage Fund. The external work was extensive and included repairs to the roof the repointing and repair to the chimneys and other stone and brickwork, with careful replacements sourced when required, repairs to the surviving cast iron rainwater goods and the replacement of PVC guttering by cast iron and work on the sash windows and doors. Internal work was designed to try and ensure the retention of any historic features that remained. The station has been repainted to a buff and cream color scheme. This was based on research into the original appearance of Stepney Station undertaken by a conservation architect with support from the Transport Collections Manager at Beamish Museum. Overall, this is a great scheme and a credit not only to the entrant but also to the other funders and in particular the support of the Beverley Road Townscape Heritage Scheme. It shows what can be achieved with a relatively modest budget and all involved should be well pleased with what they have achieved. Three very interesting projects, but who has won? Well, the winner of the Avanti West Coast Community Award is the Lanethley Railway Goods Shed Trust 
for the impressive work completed on the Lanethley Goodshed offices. So would Richard Roper and Angela Warwick Haler from the Trust please make their way to the stage to receive the award from Andy Mellers of Avanti West Coast. Thank you very much. We're very worthy winners. Um, Hull, Hull is, is, um, is underappreciated in terms of both its railway heritage and general heritage, and just sort of almost opposite Stepney Station is an absolutely fantastic project which is currently restoring an old cinema that was uh, bombed during the Second World War and has, has lain as a bomb site uh, for years afterwards and now is finally being, being uh, restored um, lo locally there. So if you need a reason to to go to Stepney, you can also go and have a look at this, this other wonderful project there. Um, so, yeah, congratulations um, uh, for that win. And, and we now turn to the National Highways Award, and this covers the restoration, refurbishment, or other means of bringing a building or structure that's no longer in railway ownership into a sustainable use. There are three shortlisted entries for this category. The first of these is to National Highways for the restoration of the Bowlside Road footbridge at Galashields. The Great Sea listed footbridge is located on the former Selkirk District Railway in the town of Galashields. The branch covered a five mile stretch between Selkirk and Galashields. Opening in 1856, the line lost its passenger services in 1951 and closed completely in 1964. This footbridge was incorrectly recorded by British Rail as having been removed, so went for decades without being inspected or maintained. I'm sure, I'm sure that doesn't happen these days. Um, National Highways accepted responsibility for the bridge after Borders Council closed it in 2021 on safety grounds because of its very poor structural condition. Work started in mid-2022 on a project to restore the bridge and to bring it back into use with work being completed in late 2023. The restoration involved encapsulating the bridge to allow removal of the old lead-based paint, repairs and renewals of the metalwork, and repainting it in its original color. The deck and its supports had to be almost entirely replaced as structural elements had wasted away to almost nothing. The structure carried a gas main which had to be diverted. The previous steel deck was replaced by galvanized steel checker plate, which is a sensible, practical solution. The gates at the end of the bridge have also been renovated and repainted. Attention to detail has included use of bolts with domed heads to secure the plates forming the new deck. This is a modest structure that is likely to be seen and used by relatively few people. The easiest solution would have been to replace it, and it is to the credit of the entrance that they chose to restore it. Now, in an excellent condition, it will serve the local community for many years to come. The second entry was made by Sidlaw Building and Joinery Services Limited for the conversion of the old goods shed at Newtile, north of Dundee. The Dundee and Newtile Railway's Newtile Station building, other than a small extension at the north end, dates from 1831 and is one of the oldest railway buildings in Scotland. From 1868, it was used only for goods traffic. However, this ceased in September 1964. The building had been vacant for many years when efforts to find a new use for it started in 2008. Proposals for retail, office or storage use were unsuccessful. Only residential use has proved viable, although this has required significant alterations to the building. 
Work started in March 2023 on the conversion of the Grade B listed structure, with the project being completed in December the same year. The walls on the south, west and north sides have been well renovated with neatly applied lime mortar. The roof has been re-slated with the timbers being repaired and replaced as necessary. The original part of the building has been converted into six terraced houses. The northern extension contains an additional room for the adjacent house and three external storerooms for the residents' use. A missing canopy on the east side of the extension has been reinstated to a modern design. The entrances to the houses and the main windows are on the east side. The original stone wall would have been destabilized by inserting these openings, so most of it has been replaced in timber. The openings in the other walls, where not used for windows, have been filled in with timber to the same specification. The residential units have been very well integrated into the original structure. The Dundee and Newtile was an important pioneering railway. This scheme represents a happy outcome for a building that might otherwise have disappeared and is a project that had community support. It has saved a building of considerable significance, both in the origins of the historic railway in Scotland and in the evolution of the national rail network that many had written off as beyond rescue. And the final entry is one entered by Greenways and Cycle Routes Limited and covers work undertaken on a tunnel and two viaducts close to Shepton Mallet on the closed Somerset and Dorset line. The two viaducts and the paired Windsor Hill tunnels were a key part of the Somerset and Dorset railway extension linking Evercreech with Bath. The line was opened in 1874 and created a direct link between the Midlands and the south coast at Bournemouth. Originally single track, a second track was added 18 years later when the viaducts were doubled and a second tunnel bored. The railway line closed in 1966 and the track was lifted. Over the past 60 years, some of the structures have disappeared and others have found new uses. One of the tunnels at Windsor Hill, for example, was used for testing of engines as part of the Concorde project. In September 2021, Work started on the clearance of the section, with work being completed on the three structures two years later. Windsor Hill is pierced with two tunnels, one of which hosts a batch colony and is closed to path users. The other has been cleared and an asphalt topping laid throughout. Although not lit, reflectors have been installed to guide users. At Bath Road, a waterproof membrane had been previously installed but badly finished. In order to complete the waterproofing, new flashings were installed along the bottom of the viaduct walls to prevent water ingress. Wildflowers were transplanted from the centre of the viaduct to create verges for the new central asphalt path. At Hamwood, a waterproof membrane has been laid to preserve the viaduct structure and the remaining ballast has been topped with a three metre wide asphalt surface. Several lengths of the viaduct wall copings were missing and the team have carefully created replicas. The scheme is part of an ambitious project that will ultimately see the creation of a long distance path and cycleway linking Shepton Mallet with Clevedon. The entrants are to be congratulated on what they have achieved and with these three structures which will eventually form an essential link for the route. So three very different projects I think you'll agree um, caused much debate amongst the adjud adjudicators, but which of this trio was the eventual choice? Well, I'd now like to invite Ray McConaughey and Tracy McConaughey from Sidlaw Building and Joinery Services Limited to come up to the stage to receive the plaque from Richard Marshall of National Highways for the transformation work at Newtile.
That's a, a very worthy winner, and I think um, lots of people in the room uh, will probably be looking at that and thinking, I know where there's a similar structure, and we could do something just as good as has been achieved there. Um, so I certainly am going to put that into my best practice folder and share it every time I see a disused good shed that is sitting there doing nothing and people saying, I can't do anything with this. Um, Anyway, we're, we're sort of getting through. There's, there's very thin bits of my, my, my commentary here to go. So uh, uh, we, are, we are getting through the awards. And we now come to the Southeastern Commercial Restoration Award. And this is for any project bringing a commercial use to a historic railway or tramway building or structure and irrespective of ownership. And again, there are three shortlisted entries in this category. And the first of these is to the Settle and Carlisle Railway Trust for the creation of the cafe and bar at Horton in Ribblesdale. The station opened with the Midland Railway's extension northwards from Settle Junction to Carlisle in May 1876. Like most of the intermediate stations on the line, it closed in May 1970. Used intermittently from 1975, it reopened to passengers fully in July 1986. The reopened station, like others, was unstaffed. A number of the station and other buildings on the line had found alternative uses. The northernmost section of the station buildings at Horton were converted into accommodation, but the southern section remained empty and prone to damp. In June 2023, work started on a 12-month project to convert the interior into a cafe and bar. Within are two rooms, complete with original ticket window and well-restored bench seating on three walls, while to the right is the former staff ticket office. The latter is simpler in design, but still attractive. In one corner is a fully accessible toilet, which has been installed. The stone flag floor is well treated. It has been totally raised and relayed to enable very effective underfloor heating to be installed. The pine flooring in the adjacent staff booking office was similarly lifted and relayed on top of underfloor heating. The original fireplaces have been restored. That in the waiting room has been opened up so the fire can be made. This is a most worthwhile project. It has been well thought through and then properly executed without corners being cut. Already it is attracting a steady stream of passing walkers on the popular Yorkshire Three Peaks Trail, which crosses the railway at the station. It is a first-class entry, which is bringing renewed life and purpose to an attractive and popular Settle and Carlisle Line station. Our second shortlisted entry was made by Wild Thinking Limited for the creation of the railway room at Canusi in Scotland. The station, which is listed Grade B, is situated on the Perth to Inverness main line and originally opened in 1863. However, the main building was rebuilt in 1891. For some 30 years from 1986, part of the station was occupied by the local council as offices. However, when the council closed the facility in 2016, the structure was left unused, unheated and receiving minimal maintenance before being purchased by the entrance two years later. In 2020, listed building consent was granted for the conversion of the building into a boutique, hostel and three-bed apartment. Externally, the major works were the replacement of all the windows and doors. The windows are timber sash and case. These are well constructed, giving an attractive appearance and are proportional for a listed building. A new porch was added in appropriate style. Minor roof repairs were carried out, as well as renewal of all the lead work to the ridges and flashings. The entire premises were in poor order internally and the multiple challenges faced prior to any conversion included lack of drawings or records, wet and dry rot, life expired windows and doors as well as, well as out of date services. The design of the rooms is modern and practical with well chosen furniture and fabrics. The high ceiling in the main room features the original timber roof trusses which have been carefully restored. The railway rooms are the product of an inspired conversion which breathes new life and purpose into a significant portion of this fine station. 
Canusi can now offer high quality accommodation for groups at a unique property with the ambience of a small modern hotel. And the third entry in this category was entered by the Landmark Trust and covers the restoration of the station agent's house at Liverpool Road Station in Manchester. This Grade 1 listed building, although not built as part of the Liverpool and Manchester Railway, does adjoin the 1830s station complex, and the house is often claimed to be the home of the world's first station agent. The residential building, since being taken over by the railway and incorporated into the station complex, has served many functions and been subject to many alterations. When the station closed in 1975, the historically important site was transformed into the city's Museum of Science and Industry. The agent's house, which had been used as a corner shop in the 1970s, formed part of the museum complex, but when no longer required, a new use was needed for the building. The Landmark Trust took on the building and has converted it into a holiday let. Work commenced on the project in 2022 and was completed two years later. External work included the lifting and relaying of the slate roof, the incorporation of new lead flashings, the provision of new windows, and the removal of cement pointing with its replacement by lime mortar. During nearly two centuries of multivaried use, much of the interior has been altered or removed, and the Trust has adopted a policy of not trying to reproduce a period interior, but rather the essence of a Georgian house. This policy has worked well and gives the interior fairly simple fireplaces, windows, door, surrounds and skirting boards. Surviving historic features were retained and repaired. The entrants are to be congratulated on another clever and effective building restoration. A new use has been found for the historically important structure, thus ensuring the building's future. Three very impressive and varied entries, but which of the trio found favour with our adjudicators? Well, the winner of the Southeastern Commercial Restoration Award for 2024 is the Landmark Trust for the restoration of the station agent's house at Liverpool Road Station. And I'd now like to invite Linda Lockett from the Trust and Andrew Wiles from Wiles and Maguire Architects to join us on the stage to receive the plaque from Nina Peak of Southeastern. Um, so, so I think as you'll have seen from um, all the foregoing entries that, that we've had uh, today, each year the competition attracts a huge range of entries from different parts of, of the rail industry. Sadly, some of the entries that we receive are not always suitable for judging. Uh, all are handled with sensitivity and explanations given as to why they perhaps haven't been shortlisted. Uh, occasionally, and this year was a case in point, there was an entry that was made but did not meet the competition's main criteria in that it was not primarily a restoration of a historic railway structure, but it was a project that it was felt by the committee to deserve recognition in that the work had created a new commercial use for a long, closed stretch of railway line. Kiltimar Station is on the derelict Clare Morris to Colooney Railway in County Mayo in Ireland. The line opened in 1895, but passenger services were withdrawn in 1963 
and goods services in 1975. The closed line was left in situ. The IRD Kiltima CLG proposed a new use for the station and the redundant railway. This was the development of a velo rail. It opened to the public in 2023 and is the first such venture in the UK or Ireland. 16 special rail vehicles were built in South Korea. These are powered by the riders pedaling. Velo rail participants can travel up to four miles in either direction from Kiltima. This is a fantastic scheme which provides employment for local people as well as increasing the number of tourists to the town with consequential increased spending in local hotels, cafes and shops. And we're delighted that Joe Kelly from IRD Kill Team RCLG and Peter McCormack from Mayor County Council have made the trip from the west coast of Ireland and I'd now like to invite them up to receive their certificate from Andy Savage. Brilliant. I'm, I'm so pleased about that. Whenever I go on holiday to France, the, first, the literal first thing I do is to look at a map of all the velo rails in France and work out how far it is to the nearest one. Uh, if you haven't been on a velo rail, um, please just go and try it. Whatever age, whatever your ability, it's, it's, a, it's a completely unique experience and, and a great way of seeing the countryside, uh, preferably whilst having someone else pedal you. Um, so our final award this morning is the Greater Anglia Award and it's given to what the awards committee judge to be the best entry in any category and the selection of the best entry each year is, is really difficult as there's always so many excellent and varied schemes which all deserve recognition for one thing or another but we're really pleased to announce that this year's overall winner goes to the Derbyshire Historic Buildings Trust for their dramatic work undertaken at Wingfield Station. Before asking the entries, entrance up to receive the award, let's just have a, a little look at the project itself. Opened in 1840, the station is the only survivor of the original 16 stations on the North Midland Railway Line from Derby to Leeds. The station was designed by Francis Thompson and is in a Grecian style, similar in form to country estate gatehouses, and which predates the corporate styles employed in the following years by more famous Victorian railway companies. The station saw its last passenger train in December 1966. As a now unique survivor, it was provided with protection from demolition through grade two listing in 1971. It was sold to a private owner by the British Rail Properties Board in 1979. By this time, it was in a very poor condition and in private ownership saw a further decline until in 2012, the Victorian Society listed the station as being one of the top 10 most endangered buildings. In 2015, the listing was re revised to grade two star, which then led to formal notice to the owner to carry out remedial action, which they then failed to do. Compulsory purchase by Amber District Council followed in 2019. The council transferred the station to the trust the same year and emergency repairs followed. Work on the restoration of the station was completed in 2023. 
Externally, on both the station and the neighbouring goods shed, the roofs were repaired and restored, along with soffits and chimneys and associated rainwater goods and lead work. Doors and windows were repaired and restored. Although the stonework was generally in good condition, it was repaired as required, especially on the goods shed. In addition, the yard was resurfaced with limestone chipping, as it was originally, while the goods platform was also repaired and restored. Internally on the station, timber boarding to the walls was renovated, lime plaster was repaired and repainted with breathable paint, with the former ladies' waiting room being wallpapered. The ceiling was repaired in lath and lime plaster, along with wet-run lime plaster coving. The existing concrete floor was not original, so this was removed, and a new limecrete floor with glass foam aggregate insulation was installed. The new floor also gave an opportunity to run services through it. The result of this project is that a community asset has been created out of a derelict shell that tells its own unique story of how an early country station would have looked and felt in 1840. The restoration has brought an historically important structure back to life and the work is exemplary at every level. This is an outstanding example of what can be achieved by local collaborative commitment. A stunning success. So to receive the Greater Anglia Award for the best entry in 2024 for Wingfield Station, I would ask Lucy Godfrey and Peter Milner of the Derbyshire Historic Buildings Trust to join us on the platform to receive the plaque from Simone Bailey of Greater Anglia. I'd now like to invite Andy Savage to say a few words. Thank you, Tim, for doing all the presentation. My congratulations to all of the winners and commiserations, but you have done brilliantly. Everybody who's been shortlisted, it's been a superb set of entries this year, and you've all done really well. Thank you so much. I want to thank the team at Merchant Taylors Hall and our colleagues on the AV side for making this um, event possible. But I particularly want to thank all the sponsors, my colleagues, the trustees, the judges, the adjudicators, all our trustees, all our helpers, our volunteers. Without their input and the financial support of our sponsors, we couldn't run the award. So thank you all so much. There are several trustees and officers I want to single out particularly this year. First of all, Clive Baker has chaired the judging panel for the last 10 year, 15 years and been a judge for over 20 years and he retires in both roles at the end of this meeting. The workload of the jobs that Clive has done is immense and runs for many months of the year and I'm most grateful to him for his organization of the judging over such a long period of time. Thank you, Clive. And I'm delighted that Clive has accepted our invitation to join the panel of patrons of the awards. The, the year has been a year of consolidation for the NRHA after the changes of our structure in 2023. Our new banking systems have settled down well, and my thanks go to Lizanne McLeod for her digitization of our financial systems and I think everybody who claims expenses from the trust will be particularly grateful that we now get them out very rapidly with digital systems. We've also increased the number of trustees so that Lizanne and Peter Waller 
are now working as trustees with the rest of the team. I particularly also want to thank Vicky Stretch for her work in sorting out our archives. Previously, these were held as physical documents in the East Anglian Railway Museum, and my thanks to Mike Stanbury, who can't be with us today, for doing that. But elements were elsewhere, and there was immense duplication of the archive held by the various trustees. Vicky has grasped this issue. I asked her for advice on how we could get someone to do the archives, and she put her hand up and said, I'll do it. I don't know whether she realised quite what she was taking on, but she's done it with her usual amazing verve and style. And 10 years of the archives are now fully digitised and available, as Tim said earlier, and the rest will follow, I'm sure, very shortly. This is important to us because we have two charitable objectives, the awards and the archive, and we've finally been able to make progress in making the archives accessible to everybody. During the last year, we've lost three long-standing judges. I'm sorry to have to tell you that David Hansen, a former colleague of mine from my intercity days, passed away. And David judged for us for many years, and we miss him greatly. Edward Doricott and John Fraser have both also stood down as judges, in both cases after amazingly long terms in post. And we thank them for their input and hope we will continue to see them from time to time. Finally, Tony Tompkins was trustee of the former charity throughout its existence from being set up to it closed down, which was a mighty contribution. And I'm delighted that Tony has accepted the offer of being a patron of the awards, a worthy addition to our list. End of the thank yous. Most grateful thanks to everybody. And thank you all for coming today. Ptolemy, can I invite you now to come to the lectern and give your address? Thank you, Andy, ladies and gentlemen. When I was seven, my parents took the decision to take, send me to a school that involved going there by train. It was a sort of five or six stop journey. Why Chillum, Chartham, Canterbury West and Sturry? Or as they used to say, why Killam and Cartham to Canterbury? <laughs> it was a charming old fashioned southeastern railway line that had somehow escaped closure because it had been electrified under the 1960 Kent Coast electrification scheme. And somehow when beaching came to strike, it was all too new to get rid of. So apart from the addition of a live rail and a few sort of lowercase sans serif signs, the place looked exactly as it did when it was a steam railway. There was an attractive collection of uh, 19th century buildings, some of them by that wonderful architect William Tress. And I'm pleased to say that the train I used to take to school went on to Margate, although we weren't allowed to go there because Margate was the location of Dreamland, which my father considered too dangerous for us at the age of seven. <laughs> um, so Margate came later. When I was at the school, it became quickly clear that going by train was much, much, much more interesting than anything that was being provided for me at the school. The lessons were boring, the sport was bewildering, but the railway was forever there, and much, much, much more interesting to me. And um, when we, um, the day was quite long, actually, so on certain days we sort of finished at about six o'clock, which was sometimes dark, so we used to go to the front end of Sturry Station and asked the driver in the cab to let us into his cab so that we could go on the train from the driving cab. And, I mean, you think of it now, but we were allowed to uh, control the dead man's handle, uh, so we were effectively driving the train between Sturry and Wye. Um, at Canterbury West, where there's a very handsome signal box on a gantry, which I hope one day will be properly restored, we had to duck in case the signalman saw us. Um, these eight-year-old children in school uniform driving the train. Um, I was very pleased to see the lady from South Eastern Railway today. She was, I see, she, that is the operator that now controls that line. I'm sure their drivers do not allow uh, eight, nine, and 10-year-olds to drive the trains on South Eastern today. It was such an amazing taste 
the signal boxes on that line, the buildings, the different qualities of architecture, that although my parents took me out of that school because they felt that the railway was a terrible distraction to me, the damage was already done. Um, I went on to continue to study railway buildings in my free time, in my teenage years, photographing and recording structures, many of which have now since disappeared. I was able to carry on into architecture school and sort of fired up by a love of these 19th century buildings, I found myself out of step with my tutors who all expected us to love the kind of flat-roofed type buildings of the clasp type that some of you will remember spreading across the southern region in the 1970s. These buildings didn't do much for me. I was rather more keen on the rather beautiful Victorian buildings they often replaced. So I carried on and I somehow managed to find a career working on lots of historic buildings, uh, including Westminster Abbey, as you hear, and Christchurch in Oxford, where I was yesterday, all these lovely buildings that I reach by going by train. And I look out of the windows of the railway system and I remember my debt that I owe to these fantastic 19th century buildings in this wonderful historic railway system. And so to find myself here today as a trustee of the Railway Heritage Trust and then actually providing certificates and, and encouragement to members of the railway industry who actually work in the railway industry to restore and to recover these lost, wonderful Victorian buildings. It is the most fantastic, extraordinary turn of events over the last 45 years from the operation of the dead man's handle and the ducking at Canterbury West to be here with you, watching you all undertake the repair and restoration of these astonishing buildings. I think it's so important that the railway system recognises the value of the ambience of the buildings it has inherited. For years and years and years, there was this sort of corporate disregard that somehow modern buildings would somehow convey a bright and efficient railway system, which the old Victorian buildings somehow would not do. This has been so roundly turned on its head by the restorations of the great London termini stations and other stations and all the stations we've seen today. People love these old buildings. They love buying cake at Brickett Wood. They love looking at converted train sheds, which people can now live in. They love these things. And we should see and rejoice in the railway heritage that we have. So I'd like to really say to you, thank you for your sustaining work in protecting the railway heritage. Your work is not unnoticed by the visiting public. It's certainly not unnoticed by innocent schoolboys traveling to work or to school by train. I continue to travel on southeastern trains. I look up at Wadhurst Railway Station. I rejoice in William Tress's building there. I despair of the surface-mounted conduits that are all over the building, but I'm sure the nice lady in southeastern is going to sort that out for me now. <laughs> Thank you very much, and have a lovely lunch. Good afternoon, everyone. It's lovely to see so many uh, friendly faces. And uh, just to add my congratulations to winners and runners-up for today. Uh, great to see one or two projects which in my previous career with uh, Rail Track Network Rail, we were desperate to make progress on and we just never, never got where we want to. And it's great to finally see those coming to fruition. So my congratulations to them in particular. I'd now like to invite shortlist entrants to come up to the stage to receive their certificates from Andy. And the first of these is the team from Arriva Rail London for the work at Bruce Grove. And next, the representatives from South Eastern uh, Trains for the cafe at Margate, please.
Next, Translink for the work completed on the sand drying chimney at Bangor in County Down. Next, Nexus, get that through, for the restoration of the stained glass at Monk Seaton. And the team for the, from Network Rail for the work completed at Lanark. Now, from Network Rail and Spence Refit Limited for Block E, the refurbishment at London Paddington. Thank you. And now to the National Railway Museum for the relocation of Gornless Bridge to Sheldon in County Durham. Gloucestershire and Warwickshire Steam Railway for the project to stabilise the parapets on the viaduct at Toddington, please. And next, the team from the Schlangoslin Railway for the completion of the new station at Corwen, please. I don't, I don't think we've got anybody in the room for that one, so we'll make sure they get the certificate. And to Network Rail, Story Contracting and MHB Consulting for the work on, completed on the Camps Viaduct at Hamilton. And next to Network Rail for the colourful work on the canopies at Great Malvern. And I just love those. I think they're brilliant. <laughs> yes, Andy's just questioned whether the drugs and alcohol policies were in place when he did it. And next, uh, the Friends of Henley Station for the renovation of Henley and Arden Station.
And next, some friends of mine, please. Uh, the North Yorkshire Moors Railway Trust for the project to restore the rail motor at Ghostland Station. And uh, I, uh, John, I don't know whether you are you coming up, John, John, John. Uh, North Yorkshire Moors Railway Trust again for the second scheme to be rewarded at Gosland, the Weybridge Office Restoration. And next, the team from Turning Tides Project CIC for the Station Tea Room at Crediton. And next, the uh, Summit Education Society for the restoration of Stepney Station in Hull. And next, National Highways for the work undertaken on the Bowlside footbridge at Gala Shields, please. Next, Greenways and Cycle Routes Limited for the conversion of the tunnels and the viaduct at Shepton Mallet. And next, the Settle and Carlisle Railway Trust for the cafe at Horton in Riddlesdale. And finally, Wild Thinking Limited for the railway room at Kingusi. I'm being, I'm being waved at frantically from the back of the room. I think, unfortunately, nobody's with us for this one. Um, before I hand back to Andy, can I just a uh, couple of uh, quick housekeeping matters? Um, winners of the plaques, packaging is available for you and including a collection of screws, double the number this year I'm told, uh, will be available for Malcolm at the back of the room when we finished here. Um, secondly, to save me going to um, Ry um, Ryman's again, uh, can you please return your uh, name badges at the end, uh, leave them on the table where you pick them up on the way in, uh, if you wouldn't mind to be grateful. Thank you very much indeed. Chairman. You. Thank you. <clears throat>
I have to say there are times when I'm glad I'm not on the adjudication panel um, because the decisions are so difficult. But when with the volunteers category, we get two shortlisted entries from the North Yorkshire Moors, which Jerry is chairman of, and one shortlisted entry from the Festinio, which I have a little connection with. I'm very glad I wasn't taking the decision. <laughs> we have actually managed it without civil war. That concludes the ceremony. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, everybody who makes it possible. Merchant Taylors Hall and our own colleagues in the NRHA. Have a great Christmas. It's always the start of the Christmas season as far as I'm concerned with this, with this ceremony. Um, and please join us for lunch and a drink. Thank you. Thank you.